Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is chapter two, um, part two, analysis of the product. In any product, however trivial, this table, that hammer, that tree in the garden, the subjective and objective aspects, the activity and the thing are intimately linked. These are isolated objects that have been separated from nature. They have definite contours and can be measured from different points of view. They have names that enter into human discourse. The word and the concept finally fix the object and immobilize it by separating it from nature. And yet these products still remain objects of nature. Nature does not provide a raw material hostile to form. The raw material itself indicates the form the object may receive. Every product, every object is therefore turned in one direction towards nature and in another towards man. It is both concrete and abstract. It is concrete in having a given substance and still concrete when it becomes part of our activity by resisting or obeying it, however. It is abstract by virtue of its definite measurable contours and also because it can enter into a social existence, be an object amongst other similar objects and become the bearer of a whole series of new relations, additional to it substantially, in language or else in the quantitative evaluation of society as a commodity. Let us examine a very simple case of action being applied to a fragment of matter. Every productive action works to detach a definite object from the enormous mass of the material universe. An object is determinate precisely to the extent that it has been isolated. Anything which re restores its relations with its material context and reintegrates it into nature destroys it as a product or as a human object. The rust on my hammer, for example, in order to be an object and as such usable, the hammer must stand out with the utmost clarity of outline and practical reality against the indefinite background of the universe. It is abstract, but with an abstraction which is a practical concrete force. Some men lift a heavy load. In this simple action, the reality of the object governs the activity directly. The shape of the load, its volume, the direction it has got to be moved in, are the objective conditions which the action obeys. Moreover, the number of men able to help and their physical strength enter as determining elements into the, sequ into the sequence of synchronized movements, which will lead to the load being shifted. By virtue of a reciprocal adaptation of men and object, the activity of this human group will acquire a form, a structure, and a rhythm. These remarks can be extended from a very simple case like this to very complex ones the manufacture of an object, a laboratory experiment, etc. Every time human effort is applied to a product, a concrete unity is formed between subject and object, looked at practically. The subject and object are not merged, neither are they abstractly distinct. They are opposed in a certain relationship. They form a clearly determined dialectical whole. The product need not be thought of exclusively in one place or at one moment of time. A sequence of phenomena can equally well be seen as a product. I put some water on the fire. The container protects the liquid from all the outside disturbances, which might hinder the desired result. The combination, fire, container, liquid, must be considered as a product of the action. Likewise, the successive series of phenomena. The rise in the temperature of the liquid, it's coming to the boil. This series is isolated in time, just as the combination of objects is isolated in space. Such a grouping of phenomena consolidated in time is known in scientific terms as a determinism. From one point of view, this series is real, material, and concrete. From another, it is abstract, in the most precise sense of that word, since to abstract means to separate or detach. The starting point for this abstraction is not in the mind, but in the practical activity. The essential characteristics of sense perception cannot be correctly deduced from an analysis of thought, 
but from an analysis of the productive activity and of the product. Abstraction is a practical power. All production presupposes the organism, the hand, the eye, the brain. It also presupposes the need. Organism and need are both plastic. Man's tendencies are not given right from the start in all their clarity, power, and rationality. The product which corresponds to a tendency helps to fix it, to make it conscious and differentiated. It reacts both on it and on the organism. Man's hand, his eye, and his brain are shaped and perfected in both the individual and the species by the use he makes of them. All production presupposes other determinations of the practical activity too, and especially an instrument or a technique. The instrument enables us to act on objective reality. It is itself an objective reality, an object of nature. It does not act on nature from outside, but as one fragment of nature reacting on other fragments. We might try from this point of view to classify instruments and distinguish them. A, those instruments which enable us to detach certain fragments from nature in relation to the interdependence of natural phenomena, these have a destructive or abstractive character. Examples are the pickaxe, the hammer, or the arrow pure quantity and quality, geometric space, etc. B, those instruments which serve to preserve the fragments thus obtained, to protect them in their isolation and to orientate the determinism subtracted from nature. Examples, the paint which prevents iron work from going rusty, containers of any sort, sub, um, substantives. Indeed, in one sense, language from the brief word of command up to scientific discourse is an instrument. C. Those instruments which then enable us to fashion the fragments that have been maintained in their isolation. D. Finally, all the results of man's activity to the extent that they serve to satisfy a need. Such a classification generalizes the notion of instrument. A house is an instrument with a certain efficacy in time and space. Likewise, the community of those working together for a common purpose. And likewise, finally, geometric and social space, clock time, etc. A technique is the combination of movements and operations aimed at a certain result, a combination that is then constituted into a determinate series, itself isolated, determining because it is determined, exactly like an instrument or object. It must be noted that as thus defined, the technique is a moment of the activity, not the whole of it. It is determined, constituted, and consolidated as the experiment proceeds. The technique as such, therefore, is not the originator of the product or of the determinations of the product, such as abstraction, significance, value, or the relation of the object to the need, the organism, and the activity. <clears throat> the technique is formed, it is a result. It is not conscious at the outset and only afterwards is it described and handed on orally. Neither physical techniques nor mental ones are directly understood right from the beginning. Hence, th hence the discoveries of the ethnographers who have established the juxtaposition in the primitive mind of correct techniques along with strange interpretations of them. Oddly enough, this surprises them. As if the same juxtaposition could not be found in ourselves, in our own day and age, in relation to physical or even to intellectual techniques, inspiration, the mystery of creation, etc. At a very advanced stage, once a large number of techniques have become conscious and been handed on explicitly, once both their specific and their general features are known, once particular techniques such as logic have been consolidated, and have provided consciousness with a skeleton. Then and only then do we become precisely aware of activity and techniques. Originally, consciousness was, so to speak, located inside the thing, inside the result of the action and inside the objective form given to the product. We discover what we are and what we do. The activity involved in production proceeds first of all hesitating, hesitantly by trials and errors that are then rectified. 
Gradually, the operation itself is consolidated and becomes a technique, after which active man examines his technique with a view to improving it and drawing from it conclusions concerning the properties of the object. He goes from the product to himself, then from himself to the product. Consciousness is formed practically through activity crystallizing into set methods and procedures, far more than through any withdrawal or retreat on the part of the subject. In this way, a painter tests himself out and discovers himself in his earliest attempts, after which he perfects his technique and modifies his style. It would be absurd to suppose that a painter might develop his gift and become conscious of it without actually putting brush to canvas. For him, painting is not merely an excuse, an occasional manifestation of a hidden talent which existed beforehand, yet such is the hypothesis formulated by idealism about mind.